I apologize for not uh, being able to be there in person, but I'd like to share with you uh, progress and the outlook of, in Connectomics. So it's been almost 10 years since then President Obama announced the Brain Initiative. And obviously one might ask what's been achieved by the Brain Initiative since then. And I think it's fair to say that the first 10 years of the Brain Initiative have primarily been about technology development. Uh, the challenge has been to observe the brain at cellular resolution. Uh, to be able to see the molecules, the, the uh, kinds of molecules that exist in all the brain cells, to see the activity of the neurons, the patterns of activity, and also to uh, map out how those neurons are connected to each other. And it turns out that the third of these quantities has historically been the most difficult to observe. Um, one can now obtain exquisite maps of the transcriptome of uh, single cells inside uh, in situ, inside a brain. Um, one can observe the activity of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of neurons simultaneously in a brain. Uh, and yet, uh, one might know zero about how those neurons are connected to each other. So um, the dream has been that if we could observe all of these quantities at cellular resolution, that would provide us with the technological means to then understand how neural circuits function uh, at the level of, you know, networks of neurons. So I'm going to talk about the third, and the third is interesting because um, it's uh, not only uh, the game of the experimentalist, there's also um, a lot of computational work that has to be done to take the data to assemble a map of, of neural connectivity. And so some of you may be familiar with the C. elegans connectome. Um, this was published in 1986 after over a dozen years of work. Um, and what was the method of mapping? Well, the this worm, this tiny worm about a millimeter long was uh, cut into ultra thin sections, say 40 nanometer, 50 nanometer sections. Uh, and then the cross sections of neurons were painstakingly traced through uh, EM, these EM images. So in those days, there were photographic plates and people used um, pen markers uh, to actually uh, trace their way through these photographic plates. Imaging this was microscopy. So electron microscopy is used to get a two-dimensional image of a single uh, ultra-thin section. Um, and the way that you build up the third dimension is by cutting, um, cutting the brain tissue into these ultra-thin sections. Uh, and that's shown, um, these ultra-thin sections are shown uh, for the second image in the middle. And then on the, in the third image on the right, you can see that those, uh, those ultra-thin sections, those slices of the brain have to be aligned uh, to form a three-dimensional volume. And this is illustrated here, not for C. elegans, but for a fruit fly brain. Uh, the first complete image of a fruit fly brain was acquired, uh, well, published in, and released in 2018 by a team um, led by Davi Bach at Janelia, HHMI Janelia campus. Um, and uh, I so this is a whole uh, fly brain image, and we've taken it and we've applied convolutional nets. Uh, we, uh, another group, applied convolutional nets to detect the synapses. But you know, I'll show you. I'll show you what's happening right now. The, the segmentation of the neurons inside this image is not perfect, and so we've crowdsourced. Um, well, okay. So I'll show you the, the 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 dimensions of the brain. So here is you can see right here um, in this kind of semi-transparent image, you can see the entire fruit fly brain. And in the color here, you can see some of the parts of the fruit fly brain that are devoted to its sense of smell, to olfaction. And you can see the rough dimensions here, 750 microns from left to right, anterior, posterior, about 300 microns. 
And so the raw images are about 100 terabytes, uh, and it's uh, four nanometer pixels, and then these physical sections are 40 nanometers thick. And so we built this site called, actually an online community called flywire.ai. And you can try it yourself. Um, you can go to flywire.ai from any web browser. And I will just have a little fun by doing that here. So let's sign in. And um, here on the left panel, I'll show you the left panel first. Let's zoom out. This is zoomed in. This is a very zoomed in view. Um, and I don't know if you can see the little circles here, tiny little circles. Uh, those are vesicles of neurotransmitter. This right here is a, is a cross section of mitochondrion. Uh, and then boundaries like this, those are the borders between uh, individual neurons. And so let's just zoom out. And so now you can see this is a cross section of the fly brain like this, cut like this. And that's a piece of the optic lobe. It's not apparent in this, I guess the, the sections are not perfectly parallel. So um, it's the other optic lobe is not apparent on the other side right here. So you can see now the scale bar is 100 microns and we can zoom back in. and the scale bar becomes 300 nanometers. So we've got a factor of about roughly a thousand, you know, here we go now, hundred nanometers. So we've got a factor of a thousand in scale. All right, so there's a lot of, you know, each one of these outlines, this yellow and pink right here, those are the cross sections of a single neuron. And if you zoom out, you can see there's a lot of neurons in here, roughly 100,000. And those yellow, that yellow, and you can see the cross sections of the yellow and the pink neuron on the left. And on the right, you can see the 3D reconstruction. Because, you know, these neurons go throughout that volume. I can page up and down in that volume. So in, in Z, these are successive serial sections. Is it possible to see that? Yeah, all right, so the connection's okay. So these are the successive serial sections. Here's the kind of defects that exist. Sometimes it's just blank space here, right? That's just real data, right? So the, the serial section was lost there, um, but you can see that the, the convolutional net can trace the neuron. It can imagine the neuron going through that black missing data. Now, this uh, automated segmentation on the right is not perfect. Um, it's got errors in it. And so we have uh, uh, a lot of humans currently, you know, maybe, well, actually right here, we can see online, there's 26 people online on the system right now. And so there's a, there's a proofreading going on. And um, any questions about that before I go back? Um, we have uh, 40 fly labs who are signed up. We have, um, and we have paid proofreaders too. And we have volunteers who just are in it for the love of science. So non-scientists, we have citizen scientists. So a, a motley crew, all right, you know, a uh, highly motivated, uh, you know, a highly motivated uh, army of, of professional and citizen scientists and um, and paid image analysts. Um, 
I'm not going to show you the process of proofreading, but basically you got to, you know, you got to take a lot of practice to find errors. But you can see that a lot of the segmentation has already been done by the automated system. Okay, so the Oh yeah, I should say a little bit about the the techniques. Um, you know, we have a whole software stack for petascale connectomics. We use convolutional nets extensively um, for both pairwise alignment of the images when we're trying to make a three D image uh, for artifact detection because there's lots of artifacts. That's a failure mode um, of the image analysis if there's some kind of artifact inside uh, artifact of the image acquisition. We use convolutional nets for instant segmentation, that is to uh, you know, distinguish between uh, adjacent neurons. We use them for semantic segmentation to, to distinguish between neurons and glia. Glia are the non-neuronal cells inside the brain, and they're used for synapse detection. We have um, software for local to global pre-processing uh, which agglomerates super voxels into reconstructed neurons. Um, and this is sort of, this is, you can think about it as a water, kind of a watershed and then a hierarchical agglomeration, but one that has to operate on petascale uh, data. We have deep learning with real world data at scale. So, um, you know, we do hard example mining. So we, uh, we find, um, the, the failure modes of the first convolutional net uh, and use and find hard examples for them and then add those to the training set and retrain. Um, we have exception handling. Uh, and then at scale, it's all distributed computing um, in commercial cloud, mainly commercial cloud, but also um, it can be implemented in, um, in academic computing, GPU clusters. And then finally, because AI is not perfect, we have AI with human in the loop. Human labor is reduced by orders of magnitude, but still some human labor is required to uh, find the errors uh, in the segmentation. And um, much of this is in preprint form or published, and all the software is available on GitHub. Okay, so that's a big software effort that we've been engaged in. Um, a lot of it funded by IARPA. Uh, since about 2015, from 2015 to 2021. Um, here's just showing you some reconstructions. So this is the beautiful uh, image showing. So here's something that you should know about the fly brain, which is that neurons are identified in the sense that you can find the same neurons in every normal fruit fly. And so you can name them. And these are the so-called CT1 visual neurons. They have these big arbors inside the optic lobes, and then they go all the way deep inside the central brain. Um, and they're bilaterally symmetric. You can find a left CT1 neuron and a right CT1 neuron, and they look very similar to each other. So that gives you confidence that the, the data quality is good enough and the reconstruction process is good enough that you're getting, um, you know, I mean, it's known that this neuron can be imaged by other means uh, with light microscopy and genetic labeling. So we can be, this is just some kind of uh, uh, gives us confidence that this whole pipeline, complicated pipeline for EM reconstruction is actually working. Um, these are the synapses, which were provided by Jan Fuki's group. Um, there's 2.4. Actually, I think that's wrong. <laughs> I don't think it's 2.4 million synapses. I think it's. Uh, uh, yeah, I thought it was more like 240 million, but OK, I'm not sure about I'm not sure about the numbers. But 10 to the fifth neurons is about right. Yeah, so I should be sort of 10 to the eighth uh, synapses. And so that's this is just showing you a zoom in on finding an actual actual synapses inside this uh, inside this fly brain. And here's a visual pathway. So 
Um, starting in the lower right-hand corner, there's a, a, um, a neuron that's close to the retina, almost almost a, a, a photoreceptor, and that synapses onto another neuron, which then synapses onto another neuron, which then goes deep inside the brain. So you can actually see a visual pathway going from the retina all the way. These are synaptically coupled neurons going all the way inside the central brain. And here's uh, yet another rendering of uh, just a bunch of randomly chosen neurons, uh, many of which are visual in function. Okay, so how are we doing? Well, the entire, um, with, in terms of proofreading, already a month ago, Flywire completed the entire central brain. That means if you leave off the optic lobes, um, we've completed the entire uh, central brain. And we're expecting that we're making good progress with the optic lobes. And so we expect that the entire brain will be done in early 2023, meaning entirely proofread in early 2023. And there's kind of a race going on. So uh, there's another team uh, at, at HMI Genelia, which is using a different EM data set to try to get the Drosophila connectome. And so this goes back into the history of connectomics. There's actually two competing approaches for doing 3D EM imaging. And the classic approach used for C. elegans is to cut these ultra thin sections and then image them by transmission electron microscopy or more recently also by scanning electron microscopy. Now, a newer approach uh, pioneered by Winfred Denk, but many variants of it have been developed by, by others. Um, that's called block face imaging. So here, what you do is you, you've got a block of tissue. You image the, the face of the block using scanning electron microscopy. And then when you're done imaging, you shave off the top of the block using a diamond knife or these days with an ion beam. You, sh you mill off the top of the block with an ion beam, expose a new block face, and then you keep on, you, and then you image the next block face. So Janelia actually generated the first serial section data set, as I said, in 2018, but they kind of threw it out. They said it was not possible to apply automated reconstruction methods because the data wasn't good enough. And they proceeded to acquire uh, a whole fly brain using uh, this other method, this other block-based approach. And in the meantime, uh, we fished this data set sort of out of the dumpster, and we showed that it's possible to apply AI to do an automated reconstruction. And so um, we, we think we're gonna finish in early 2023. All right, so I, I've said a little bit about the, um, uh, the technology. You might ask, well, what kind of neuroscience can we do with connectomes? And I can tell you that although the fly connectome is not complete, parts of it have already excited neuroscientists. Um, and a lot of that credit is due to Janelia. So they completed um, the wiring diagram of the visual column in 2013, and that's been used to uh, study the neural circuits, you know, how it is that a fly can actually compute the motion, compute the direction of motion of a visual stimulus. Um, they've been studying the mushroom body, uh, which has a role, which is important for olfaction and for learning and memory. And most recently, Janelli published a so-called hemibrain. Um, it's sort of a little less than half a central brain. And that's been used to discover interesting uh, circuits, interesting circuitry uh, responsible for navigation in the so-called fly central complex. So the the fly, you know, Drosophila circuits community is very excited about this, and the applications, it's clear, are, are far. They're going to exceed the imagination of the creators of the technology. And I think that um, you know, we said this. I said this. Many of us said this 15 years ago. I think connectomics is on its way to becoming foundational for neural circuits for neuroscience, much as genomics has become for biology. Um, and um, 
For those of you who are computationally minded, you might ask, what can a computer scientist do with connectomes? And there's an obvious kind of knee-jerk reaction, which is that, well, a connectome is, um, you know, a wiring diagram. Actually, I didn't, I showed that here. Uh, you know, this is the the elegance connectome. Every one of these nodes is a neuron. It's got a name, right? Because C. elegance has identified neurons, and so we can we can actually name the neurons, the 300 neurons in C. elegance. And every one of these lines is a synapse, a connection, a synaptic connection between neurons uh, inside C. elegance. And many of these connections, most of these connections are chemical synapses, which are directed edges in a graph. Um, some of them are electrical synapses, which are could be thought of as undirected edges uh, inside the graph. So once you have a graph, uh, then you know computer scientists can go crazy with uh, various methods of analyzing that graph. Um, you know, graph layout, um, spectral clustering, stochastic block models, et cetera, et cetera. These things have been done for decades, but restricted to C. elegans, but now connectomic information is exploding. And I'll just show you an example from, um, from my own lab, so Tony um, <clears throat> Tony Yang, a grad student, has taken 50,000 fly neurons in the, in the fly central brain, and he's applied a stochastic block model to divide them into 28 clusters. Oh, sorry, this is not stochastic block model. I think this is spectral clustering. So he's identified 28 clusters, and um, then you can uh, uh, draw uh, it's graph reduction. You can actually draw an effective graph between those 28 clusters, and you can classify the clusters as visual, olfactory, or motor, or other, uh, and, and you can see a rough feed-forward flow of information, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so you can do some very nice uh, studies applying these graph algorithms to elucidate the overall organization of the nervous system. And here's one of the example clusters. So this just falls out of the spectral clustering out of the computation. This is actually, um, you know, you, you take the graph, you do the clustering, and this is the cluster of neurons, and this is the so-called ellipsoid body. Uh, amazingly, it's kind of truth is stranger than fiction. These neurons, I don't have a good um, zoom it over here, but these neurons are arranged like a donut. They form a donut at the center of the fly brain. Uh, and this is the so-called ellipsoid body. Um, and it, neurons in this ellipsoid body encode the, um, the heading, the direction in which the fly is heading. It's an angular variable. So <laughs> amazingly, the neurons that encode this angular variable are actually physically arranged in a donut. And this is you know, not our discovery, but this is being studied by uh, a number of labs around the world. All right, so what other kinds of, of, of questions could you study? Well, um, to motivate uh, why connectomes are useful for neuroscience, I'll just draw, draw on the ideas of artificial neural nets. So in artificial neural nets, you start with, a, with an architecture, a network architecture. And then you apply your learning algorithm, which typically is, is back propagation. Uh, and then you get something which uh, ideally performs some interesting computational task. And so uh, if you were to use the language of, uh, of the brain, of the brain sciences, then you might say that um, the architecture is really nature and learning algorithms are nurture or um, I guess another way of putting it, genes versus experiences. So genes encode some kind of innate brain architecture, uh, and then experiences are uh, what, what enable the brain to actually learn uh, and uh, acquire its capabilities. And so connectomes can be used to investigate both nature and nurture. Um, you, you could say that you know part of the structure in a connectome is, is, is specified by the genes, uh, part of it comes from experiences uh, in a fly or a worm where 
the nervous system is highly stereotyped and very similar from individual to individual, we would say that the connectome is mostly shaped by nature, mostly shaped by the genes, with a little room for learning from experience. But as we go to a mouse or a human, uh, there is all that genetically predefined structure, but there's also a more and more contribution from learning. You know, humans are famous in the animal kingdom for their ability to learn all kinds of skills that are clearly not genetically encoded. And so there's a lot of interest then in investigating the brains of mice or other mammals, you know, even humans. Um, and so connectomics is also being applied to uh, mammalian brains. And so this is another project that I've been involved with. Um, it's a cubic, a reconstruction of a cubic millimeter of mouse visual cortex. Uh, and so uh, you can see here is a little cartoon showing where this piece of brain came from inside a mouse. Um, the It's a piece of cortex. So the cortex is the sheet of, of brain tissue on the outside of the brain. And so this is just showing you roughly a square millimeter of that um, from sort of the dorsal view right here of the brain. And these, these, this map right here shows you a bunch of visual areas uh, inside the mouse brain. And I should say that a cubic millimeter of human cortex has also been reconstructed recently by Harvard and Google. Um, and we not only have the, the structure, the the structure of the of the mouse the, the piece of mouse brain here also um neural activity while the mouse i should say while the mouse was alive the responses of the neurons in this region to visual stimuli were, were recorded by calcium imaging so while the mouse was alive um, the visual responses of the neurons the neural activity was recorded and then after the mouse, uh, at, you know, post-mortem, then the structure of this neural network um, was imaged by electron microscopy. And so this is just showing on the bottom the visual stimuli presented to the mouse, uh, and you can see the um, light microscopic imaging of the neural activity. It's just a still image uh, showing uh, how, the, how the experiment was done. And this data has been released. Um, uh, this is a, a site called Microns Explorer, and all the data is publicly available, both the EM images and the calcium imaging of the, of the neural activity. It's all been uh, publicly released um, at this site. And you might ask, what's the difference with uh, uh, Santiago or Ramoni Cajal? And, you know, there's many, you can see many uh, uh, visualizations of neurons um, uh, published but typically those are one or a few neurons in isolation. So uh, Cajal had made these wonderful drawings of neurons and got the Nobel prize for his, his work on the neuron doctrine, but he used techniques that sparsely stained 1% uh, or less of the neurons inside of brain. So he could only see a sparse sample and he couldn't see any synaptic connections, no synapses. So what we have in these reconstructions is something that Cajal would really like uh, you know, 100% 100 of the neurons and also revealing how these neurons are connected to each other. Okay, so I would um, uh, now like to talk about the future. So I told you about the state of the art, in, which is petascale connectomics. And the NIH has announced another program called Brain Connects. Uh, it's going to begin next year. And it's an ambitious program to map the whole mouse brain, not just a cubic millimeter, but a whole mouse brain. Uh, that's about a cubic centimeter. And it's 10 to the eighth neurons, um, 10 to the 12 synapses, 5,000 kilometers of wires. Uh, and uh, you know this is exascale connectomics. It's, it's gonna require 1,000 X increase over the current uh, petascale state of the art. And there's a number of competing proposals. So uh, there's a competition going on uh, between technologies. 
So, you know, how could you map an entire mouse brain? And so one obvious candidate is to scale up traditional serial section EM, to scale it up again. You don't scale from a worm to a fly. Why not scale from a fly to a mouse, a whole mouse brain? Um, but it's daunting because, you know, you'd have to cut uh, this whole mouse brain into over 100,000 ultra thin sections. And each of those sections is a full square centimeter in area. So that's, that's a pretty daunting challenge. Many people think that that's not possible uh, because cutting 40 nanometer, you know, even a small 40 nanometer section is already pretty difficult. So another um, horse in the race is to make a hybrid of serial section and block based approaches. So why not cut a whole mouse brain into uh, one micron sections? Um, ideally cutting, you know, cutting one micron section is, is, is going to be easier than cutting 40 nanometer sections. And um, fewer sections are required to cut through the entire mouse brain, right? Because it's a fixed distance that you have to go. So once you've cut these one micron sections, then use block based imaging to, um, to image each section with an axial resolution that's, you know, maybe as good as eight nanometers or 16 nanometers, just by using a wide area ion beam milling machine. And Ken Hayworth and Harold Hess at Genelia are, have been pioneering that approach. So I'd like to talk about a third approach, um, which is serial section electron tomography. And so uh, in this idea, we would cut the whole mouse brain into semi-thin sections, not 40 nanometers, but let's say 120 nanometers. Uh, or, you know, you could, if you have a high voltage electron microscope, you, you could go up to one micron. But let's say 120 nanometers. Those are easier to cut and there's fewer of them to collect. Um, now you still need good axial resolution. So you image each section at multiple tilt angles. Uh, and then you do a tomographic reconstruction. And so the great part about that is that Serial section electron tomography, of course, is a well-established, you know, electron tomography in general is a well-established technique. So what's, what's the, you know, what it's, it was serial section uh, tilt series was demonstrated uh, in 1993 by uh, Soto et al. Uh, there's um, eTomo iMod software by David Mastronardi, um, which has uh, been around since 1997 at least. And so, you know, you, you collect these multiple, you take a section and you collect uh, projections in the electron microscope at multiple tilt angles. Uh, and then you do a tomographic reconstruction of each section. And then you put those sections together, ideally to make a seamless stack. So what's the catch? Well, there's two catches. Um, and one of them is that we want to scale to a cubic centimeter volume or even a cubic millimeter volume is, is challenging enough, right? So, um, you know, electron tomography is well established for organelles and maybe individual cells, but for large volumes, there is some, at least some engineering, you know, to be done. And then the second catch is that we wanna make do with just a few tilt angles, right? We don't wanna to have to uh, image every section a hundred times. Uh, because already just acquiring uh, an exascale image of a whole mouse brain, um, that is a daunting challenge in itself to do that in a reasonable amount of time within a few years. And so if we now have to multiply that by, you know, 50 or 100 uh, tilt angles, uh, that could could prove to be prohibitive. We want to be able to do the tom tom tomographic reconstruction with a relatively small number of tilt angles. Okay, so um, here um, we're, uh, we're we're proposing to uh, do tomography with convolutional nets using supervised learning. 
right? So there's traditional techniques like back prop, back projection and iterative reconstruction, um, but maybe a supervised learning approach could could work here. And I, you know, I think this is not news to most of you. Uh, papers like this have been coming out, um, and so I, I'll just show you some results that we have with uh, synthetic data. So these are uh, so what we can do is we can take block face imaging data. So the I told you about block face imaging, and there's data, data data sets that have been published that have isotropic eight nanometer resolution. And using those data sets, we can simulate 120 nanometer physical sections just by putting together many of these. You know, we take the eight nanometer uh, uh, Actual resolution and just put average many of those together, and then we get the equivalent of a 120 nanometer section. And then we can simulate tilts uh, through by looking at different projections. We can simulate tilts of these synthetic sections. And so, uh, what I've shown you here are plus and minus plus and minus 45 degree tilts of simulated 120 nanometer uh, physical sections. And, and um, you know, you can see that uh, the images do look fairly, you know, there's some similarity between these images, but uh, they do look fairly, fairly different. All right, so the hope would be that you can actually pull out uh, some depth from this. And so, um, so we have a numerical experiment, which is, and this was done by uh, Kisak Lee, uh, who's now at, he's a former lab member now at Zeta AI, which is a company that's been spun off to uh, provide connectomics uh, to any, you know, provide connectomics as a service to, uh, to neuroscience labs. And so he, uh, he took, he, he generated five dual axis tilts. So, uh, every section, there's a zero degrees, and there's plus or minus 45 degrees around the x-axis, plus or minus 45 degrees around the y-axis. Um, he had these 120 nanometer physical sections uh, simulated. And then he added white noise, uh, which was independent across the views. Just to, I mean, it's not really, obviously real images have a lot more issues than that, but as a, as a minimal thing, he just added white noise um, to make the image formation process not perfect. And uh, his target output then was uh, to try to get 24 nanometer axial resolution to improve the axial resolution by a factor of uh, five. And because it's synthetic data, uh, we, can, we know what the right answer has to be. Right, uh, so the comp it can be turned into a supervised learning problem, and so uh, you can see the uh, result here. Um, here are three orthogonal views of um, the uh, of the zero degrees. Uh, sorry, the zero degree. So imagine I made a, an image stack out of the zero degree views of these 120 nanometer sections. Uh, and then we apply uh, the convolutional net. Actually, I'll, go, I'll do, do it this way. Let's do it this way. So here's um, image re tomographic reconstruction. So you can see now that we've got, imagine we have a stack of 120 nanometer sections but now we apply the convolutional net and, and we use as input the five dual axis simulated tilts. And you can see that the reconstructed image um, looks extremely good, just from five tilts. This is not training data. So the, the convolutional net was trained on a training set and then it was applied to different images uh, as a test set, images that had never seen before. And so you can see, uh, here's the XY view, 
uh, and XZ and YZ. And you can see that uh, the uh, axial resolution looks extremely good. And so that's the classic tomographic reconstruction, reconstructing the image. Um, you could just um, feed that to now a convolutional net, which detects boundaries in the images, neuronal boundaries. And that's the beginning of our, our neuronal segmentation algorithm. But another way of doing it is to um, go directly to boundaries. So here is a net. Uh, we, had, we had humans. We actually have uh, human annotations of these boundaries in that original uh, FibSem data set. And so we can train the convolutional net to go from five dual axis simulated tilts directly to um, a boundary detection. So uh, the net says one when it's the interior of a neuron and the, and the output of the net is zero when it's a boundary between two neurons. And so just flipping back and forth, here's the, um, here's the low resolution physical section images from zero degrees and here's the boundary detection based on uh, the five tilts. Okay, so I've, I've um, you know, I tried to convince you, this is sort of proof of principle, it's, it's synthetic data, and I haven't shown you any quantification because this is a early, you know, these are very early results. I don't have quantification, but at least qualitatively, you can see the potential for su a supervised learning approach to image reconstruction and boundary detection slash segmentation based on tilt views. Okay. So you might ask then, what about, you know, you use supervised learning, um, but in reality, if you don't want to use synthetic data, how will you get the ground truth for supervised learning from real data? And um, that's straightforward, right? You just apply traditional tomography algorithms after you've collected a large number of tilt views. So take a small, small make a small data set collect a large number of tilt views, standard, you know, one degree increments, and apply traditional tomography algorithms to get the so-called truth, and then do supervised learning with just a subset of a few of those tilt views uh, in order to, you know, train, the, train a convolutional net to get the same answer or approximately the same answer uh, with very few tilt views. And so, um, when I say traditional tomography algorithms, um, you know, I think there is some room for innovation there too. Uh, and that's innovation, at least in the implementation. So Kyle Luther, um, a member of the lab, uh, has a new implementation um, of iterative reconstruction. And it's based on, um, you know, modern software libraries for auto differentiation and GPU compilation. And that allows you to efficiently and optimize many image formation parameters, not only efficiently in terms of computer time, but efficiently in terms of, you know, of, of uh, researcher time. So uh, he's uh, he's developed he's been developing this package. It's very young. The software it's in Python and so on. So it's easily extensible, uh, and so we think it's going to be useful to a lot of people. And we just uh, Eric Hammerschmidt uh, in my lab has acquired some. Uh, tilt series data from mouse retina, and you can see um, the on the right here uh, some of the first results from serial section electron tomography uh, using iterative reconstruction. Uh, and uh, you can see in the third dimension, um, you can identify small structures like vesicles from the tomographic reconstruction. So it remains to put all this stuff together, but I think this is a, a promising beginning. Uh, so that's the plan for handling real images. We'll do ground truth with conventional algorithms and lots of tilt angles. We'll do supervised training of convolutional nets with a few tilt angles and a lot of training set augmentation. So alignment is a big deal uh, in tomography, as I understand it. So, uh, but we, you know, we have a lot of expertise in alignment, but also we train our convolutional nets to be robust to misalignment by uh, when we train them, we actually, um, introduce simulated misalignments into the training set. And then we plan to apply the convolutional nets to large scale data after the training. 
All right, so to close, uh, there's been a technological revolution in connectomics driven by imaging plus computation. Uh, C. elegans uh, was done by manual image analysis. Uh, Drosophila, the Drosophila connectome is almost complete and it's being enabled by automated image analysis, uh, you know, obviously benefiting from the deep learning revolution. And um, now we face the challenge of scaling up to an entire mouse brain uh, which is going to require much more, you know, big advances in AI to improve the accuracy to an even higher level. Uh, but I think these advances are opening an era of, of connectomic discovery, um, addressing both the innate and the learned structure of the brain. And so I want to conclude by thanking uh, a lot of lab members um, who have contributed to this project at Princeton, especially, um, and not only lab members, but also uh, my collaborator, Professor Mala Murphy, uh, who is uh, an expert on fly neural circuits and has, has been my partner in, in tackling in Flywire. We have collaborators at Genelia um, who helped us get that uh, old data set in order. Um, and then we have uh, collaborators at the Baylor College of Medicine and the Allen Institute for the mouse, um, the cubic millimeter of mouse cortex. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Google uh, connect them as a Google for their help in various uh, areas, uh, IARPA and NIH for funding, uh, and then also Google and Amazon for generously um, hosting some of these data sets uh, for, pub for public release. So that's, uh, they're really helping out the research community by um, making the data freely accessible to all. And so I'll stop here. And I don't know if we have, I'm sorry, I think I ran over, but if we have time for questions, I'd love to take questions.